is so advantageous over CFI because, you know, FTX, everyone's been sitting on this assumption for a long time that they are just printing money and they have, you know, um, they're completely safe in every way, but there's no real way to verify that um, until they get bank run and then it manifests this weakness. And whereas in DeFi, you can see, you can just like look right now and see, okay, on liquidity, on Aave, who would get liquidated where? Are there any bad debts? Like, you know that right off the bat. And, you know, even the exposure that like FTT had in DeFi was the easiest thing to track down. The moment that finance started dumping FTT, our team looked um, at Wave and said, okay, what's our exposure to this in various positions we hold? And you can just go and see, here's where it's being used. And, and um, you know, for obvious reasons, that's also what Alameda prioritized. Like if you look at Abracadabra, they had a lot of FTT um, collateral and Alameda just came in and paid all of that off. Um, so it, t- super sad, but to me, it's, it's another just demonstration of why DeFi is, is a better um, way forward, in my opinion. Cool. And maybe last question on that. What is your takeaway for asset managers, that, asset managers that are newer in the space out of these events? Yeah, good question. You know, um, I think so one of the things that we've talked about a lot internally is so we one of the things that we do a lot of is manage stable coin for yield. Um, and we have relationships with centralized counterparties that we can lend to. And then we have um, opportunities to, to use these assets in DeFi. For a long time, we have only been playing in DeFi. And I, I think there's been this perception by outsiders that, well, DeFi is really risky. But if you lend to so-and-so, that's less risky. We've actually viewed it the opposite for a while now. And this is like another um, demonstration of that, which is that you know if you have a decentralized platform, especially if it's also immutable. So, you know, your your due diligence that you did six months ago is still relevant today. Um, and uh, with really solid mechanism design, et cetera, and you know who your counterparties are and you know how liquidations will happen and you you know there's not some like hidden hole or whatever, um, it's, it's really in a lot of ways the safer place to play. And so, um, not just from a returns perspective, but even from a risk perspective, we've tended to favor DeFi over CFI, um, like significantly. Like I said, we haven't when when the three AC meltdown happened, we also had no CFI exposure um, in in those funds, and and it and it was like a really it demonstrated how um, good of a choice that was. Um, and this is like demonstrated it even more strongly because FTX blowing up is is so much more unexpected and so much bigger than Voyager, Celsius, et cetera, 3AC. And so um, so that's one of the things that, that I would say is that um, I think some people who are maybe newer to crypto have their logic inverted. They think that um, they think that DeFi is inherently risky and that CFI is is kind of like the safer thing. And I think, in a lot of cases, that's inverted. Now that that's with the like um, asterisk that you need to do your due diligence on the DeFi stuff too. Because okay, Mango Finance is a good example of like you look at that protocol and it's very obvious very quickly that it has bad um, mechanism design. So you want to stay away from those. Um, I'm talking high quality blue chip um, DeFi protocols, ideally that are immutable, um, and then also that don't accept um, uh, like unfettered long tail crypto assets as collateral. That was Mango's big problem, right? Like Mm. that's such an obvious thing. It's such an obvious exploit that like um, it was, I I think it was unethical of the, of um, Avraham to, uh, to exploit them, but it was obviously like really bad mechanism design where at the very least put a mint cap on your Mango since it's a long tail, easily manipulated asset price. You know, so anyway, that's kind of high level my thought on that. Cool. Thanks on that. And then now maybe let's go back to our um, uh, topic of, of today. So we really want to look at liquidity and way financial and what to do with liquidity. So first to give listeners uh, a bit of uh, context, 
can you tell a bit more about you and Wave Financial, what your offerings and your clients are, so we understand a bit your business? Yeah, absolutely. So we're a crypto asset manager, SEC registered, um, <clears throat> one of the one of the few kind of in that more regulated um, part of the space. And and we do a few things. Kind of our our the biggest part of our business is is crypto native treasury management. Say you're some big L1 or or application or whatever, you have a treasury, um, and say it's a mix of your own native token and some stable coins or whatever, and you have various business needs. We'll we'll manage that as your fiduciary. So. Um, and there's there's various things you may need there. You might need to earn some yield on your stable coins. You might need to um, diversify your treasury or use your treasury productively. Or, you know, and sometimes um, you can you can kind of serve multiple needs at once. You know, in the case of a layer one, maybe you have your treasury and your native token. And one of the things we can do is use that productively in DeFi in your own ecosystem and you generate yield and also help facilitate the health and development of your ecosystem. Right. So it's kind of uh, dual purpose. So uh, we do like a lot of those things for crypto native treasuries. We have a number of funds. Um, one is a stable coin yield fund and we'll take LPs from, you know, crypto natives, um, uh, both organizations, you know, DeFi teams that have some stables they need to earn some yield on. They don't want to manage it, manage it themselves, um, but also um, accredited investors. And and then we have some LPs that are um, uh, kind of traditional um, institutions um, that are wanting to play a little bit more in the crypto space. And a lot of them are wanting to enter in the stablecoin side. I think there's the perception a lot of people have that most institutions are entering through Bitcoin. My perception is... There's probably some truth to that, obviously. I mean, Michael Saylor's company entered through Bitcoin, right? But um, but a lot of companies are entering through stable coins. Like, hey, we just need to earn some better yield um, on some of these assets. So we uh, so um, those are some of our clients. And then we also have um, uh, we manage assets for um, mostly like crypto whales. So you know, accredited investors. Um, uh, that have, say, you're sitting on a whole bunch of ETH, um, you want someone to custody it for you and then manage it, et cetera. And we have a number of those, like we'll, we call them wealth clients that, um, you know, yeah, we will custody their um, assets and then um, engage in various strategies for them. Like maybe they want to generate yield on their ETH. And so we will um, uh, develop a custom um kind of strategy or or framework for them and then we'll uh, generate yield on their ETH for them or or maybe they just want to you know borrow against their ETH you know we'll talk about that a little bit here and it's like okay you can um, we, we can help you get better terms on borrowing than you could um, going to some centralized parties etc so um, yeah so various things so we're managing assets for for crypto whales for accredited investors for crypto native treasuries and then also some uh, institutional investors, mostly on the stablecoin side. Okay, cool. And your role at Web Financial? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm on the DeFi team. So um, uh, it's a small team, and it's I, I would call it both vertical and horizontal. So we will do DeFi things anywhere that's applicable on um, for any of our funds. And then we have some DeFi focused funds. We also have um, a few VC funds, and I will join the VC team anytime it is relevant to DeFi. So, um, so if we're if our VC team is talking about making an investment in the DeFi protocol, then I am part of that process. But if they're dealing with non-DeFi related stuff, then I'm I'm completely out of that loop. And then, yeah, we man manage stable coins and custom strategies. So it's kind of a vertical and horizontal role. And 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 then we have. Kind of coming down the pipe, we'll have more DeFi focused funds over time. So right now, the main one is a stablecoin yield fund. Uh, we have a Bitcoin yield fund, but it's not DeFi. It's it's selling covered call options um, on to like you know OTC desks. Um, but yield generating funds on other assets like Ethereum, etc., are are things that we're looking at launching as well. And um, and some of those are are the most exciting to me. Like um, generating yield on stable coins is great, but generating yield on ETH I think is super exciting. And and so we're talking about um, expanding those offerings over time. Cool. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. So maybe let's 
have also a look on on the liquidity side. So maybe that there are some people that are not fully familiar with, with the liquidity side. And I think that's maybe a great opportunity that I don't explain what liquidity is in, in my own words, but maybe you could also um, tell the audience how you discovered liquidity and how you would describe it in your own words when you, for example, then, then explain it to, to your clients. Uh, yeah, good question. So how I discovered liquidity? Well, um, background before I was full time in DeFi, I was working as a data scientist. I won't get into my back history, but have been deeply, deeply obsessed with DeFi since it's existed. Like, I remember before MakerDAO launched getting super stoked about interviews with Rune Christensen and wondering if, if you know, uh, decentralized collateralized stablecoin could even work. Um, so I've been very um, you know, aware of developments as they've, as they've, as they've come. So clear back in the early days of liquidity before it even launched, I was, I was following it, uh, super stoked about it at launch. And, um, so I've, I followed, um, your, you know, your team and your products, um, since before I was at wave, honestly. And, um, the way that I describe it to clients is that it is a, um, a super high quality, very low cost place to borrow against your ETH. Um, and um, high quality because it's immutable and because um, the mechanisms are, are super efficient. So um, you, have, you have really efficient quality me uh, mechanisms for maintaining the LUSD peg uh, with redemptions. Um, and then the uh, stability pool for liquidations is, is very efficient. Um, and then that comes with these other benefits too. Um, that are I'll, I'll I'll get into it in a bit, but it's a, it's a huge benefit to our clientele that um, you can allow a more aggressive loan to value um, or over collateralization ratio um, uh, because of how efficient the system is. Um, our clients are not DGENs; no one's like borrowing right up to that level. But having that bigger buffer is an attractive thing. Um, so that's the way I describe it: very low cost, high quality, efficient. Um, uh, place to borrow against your ETH. Cool. And can you tell us more about the, the use cases? How, on a high level, we can then deep dive in, in, in each of them, but how you you use it as uh, the way financial and how, how it would look like, you know, for like typical client, well, what their need is and what you then do with, with liquidity so we get a bit more uh, hands-on idea? Sure, yeah. So there's, there's I, I would say there's kind of four major ways. So one is, a person just wants to borrow against their ETH. Um, and we've had this happen with clients where a, a client that we're custing some ETH for says, hey, I want to go, we send my ETH back to me, I want to go borrow against it on BlockFi and buy a house. And, and literally, the, the, you know, one of the use cases, it was the first week I was at Wave, I was on a call where that was the exact conversation. And I was like, why would they send it to BlockFi? Let's uh, look at DeFi options. And um, that was one of the easiest conversations I've ever had, which is we just had a call with the client and said, look, okay, on BlockFi, you'll pay 8%. And then, you know, in DeFi, here are your options. And it was like, you know, Liquidity, Aave, Alchemix, and MakerDAO. And, and um, for that particular client and for many clients, Liquidity uh, turned out to be uh, a really great option. And so for one, it's, hey, a person just wants utility on their ETH. They want to borrow against their ETH to buy something. Um, and they're going to be holding that loan for a long time. You know, they'll, they'll pay it back over time. But it's it's like a you know a crypto native you know low cost mortgage. So so that's one use case. Um, another use case for a for a holder of ETH of ours is hey I want to earn some yield on my ETH and um, and then you have options and we'll we'll um, present a, a number of options and then sometimes have a blended strategy. So one option is uh, you stake your ETH in a liquid staking derivative. Okay. So another is you lend it or you stake it and liquidity provide it. But a, a third option is you you uh, mint some LUSD against it on liquidity and then you um, just either earn stable um, coin yield on that um, or throw into the stability pool and um, and then and then you just manage the loan uh, the debt ratio, right? So so if I can borrow on liquidity at zero and I can farm say 10% on stables and I left it all in stables, the the risk if you're if you're managing it is is um, surprisingly attractive. Like um, so, even in the event that that um, the market dumps, you can just pull back and pay down. 
Um, and so uh, that can be an attractive yield generating strategy for some clients. And, and you know, and there's, it depends on clients, uh, you know, risk profiles and, um, and then also um, is someone wanting to earn ETH on ETH or are they wanting to earn dollar yield? Um, so they, these are some of the considerations. Um, so that's, that's another um, uh, way that, um, that uh, we can use liquidity. And then two other quick ones uh, from the, from the stable coin side. Um, if I have a client, um, who has, um, some stable coins and they say, Hey, I want to just dollar cost average into ETH. Um, an easy way to do that is to convert to LUSD, throw in the stability pool. And then, okay, if there's a bunch of liquidations, you just DCA at a discount. Great. And then if there's not, and you say, okay, um, I've been sitting here for a month. I was paid for my time because I'm getting some LQTY. Um, but I wanted to be DCAing faster than that. Then you can you know, market buy with, you know, you can market buy as you need to, you know, if you're, if you're employing that strategy six months ago, you got some nice liquidations. Um, but you know, over the last few months, there have been fewer. So you can just, you, you say, well, you know, while you're sitting on the stable, you earn some yield. If there's liquidations, great. And then if not, you can pull a little bit out and swap for ETH. Um, so that it, it's, it's a really attractive kind of DCA strategy um, for clients. And then the last one is for our stable coin yield fund, um, LUSD is this very, very, very high quality stable. Um, and so, um, earning yield on LUSD is attractive and, you know, there's a few places that we have done that. One is liquidity providing LUSD on DEXs. Um, and then another is, um, uh, farming yield in the, in the stability pool, um, kind of B protocol style where, you know, if you have any liquidation rewards, you just roll it back into LUSD. So those are kind of, um, I would say the four ways that that we've used um, liquidity. Cool, great. Thanks for the overview. Maybe let's break it down and also explain it a bit to users that are not so deeply in, in involved in the ecosystem. So the first one I think was the boring use case. And I think usually you say you have clients, they go to BlockFi, they send their ETH, they pay the 8% 8, 8 and they get um, the loan uh, on liquidity. It's similar, just because, but it's the liquidity protocol. You take your ETH, you put it into liquidity, you can take up a loan of 90% in the LUSD stablecoin. You pay a one-off fee of 0.5%. Uh, so the loan has no maturity and you can keep it as long as you want. And kind of, yeah, you have the same effect. On one side, you have BlockFi that's centralized where you have counterparty risk on the other part that's the DeFi option where you don't have the counterparty risk but the technical risk so uh, just to highlight that and uh, you know what I love about you and when you when we talked about what you do at the way financially is really that you have these client stories you know that that's a bit um, I mean we launched a protocol it's immutable it's running out there but it's running on its own so it's dealing with the, his, its clients on its own and we don't have any contact. So that's what I love and I would like to hear a bit these, these client stories, the client feedback, how, how they react, because that's something we are not so close to. Um, so I would love to hear a bit kind of how people react or respond when, when you tell them that. And then also, honestly, a bit what, what you tell them, what are the pros? What are maybe the cons um, of the solution or what do you need to be aware if you use liquidity or what are the great advantages, but what all, what do you also need to be aware of? Sure. Yeah. So these are, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great questions. And I'll, I'll get into uh, one specific story that I think we'll, we'll um, touch on a lot of this. So, you know, solutions like BlockFi, I think are interesting in that um, they're attractive to people who are in crypto, but feel af afraid of, of um, operating in uh, the blockchain by themselves. You know, it can be pretty scary to have all this money in a wallet and, and you don't know if you're going to get exploited and someone steals your private key and all of this. And look, I was um, a little bit, I remember when I first learned how to use MetaMask, I went over to a friend's house and he was like helping me set up my MetaMask and showing me how to do a Uniswap trade. And it was like, and I was already deep into crypto, but DeFi was just starting to emerge. And it was like, you know, getting familiar with, with how to do all of that there's, there's a big learning curve and then people have looked around and, and very, you know, and like justifiably been afraid, like, I, Hey, I, I have a personal friend. In fact, um, one of the, the friend that showed me how to use this, um, use MetaMask for the first time, uh, got exploited and, um, lost 
a massive amount of money um, over the course of an hour and there's no recourse, right? So people are can be afraid to use this. So it's like, okay, BlockFi is really simple UI and I don't um, have to you know, worry about uh, <clears throat> uh, some exploiter taking all of my money. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it, DeFi brings these other major advantages and in, in certain ways is much, much lower risk. And so um, lower risk in a few ways. One, um, the centralized counterparty can become a problem as we've seen. You know, if, if they lose a bunch of money and then they have to lock up user assets and, and okay, that's as good as if an exploiter took your money, maybe, okay, not quite as bad, but you know, in, in the ballpark. And then um, BlockFi also um, has uh, less attractive terms in multiple ways. So they, they charge high interest and then they also, um, uh, their loan to value um, is, is um, more conservative than liquidity, right? So at a given price of ETH, you're more likely to be liquidated there. Um, you know, or a given loan to value, you know, hey, I have a thousand ETH and I borrowed X amount of money. I'm going to get liquidated at a, at a higher ETH price there than on liquidity. So there are kind of advantages and disadvantages in both. And, and so I think some of our clients that were wanting to do this through BlockFi are just like, I don't want to be doing this myself. I don't know how to do it and I'm afraid to do it. And that, um, and, and so we're like, well, we can do it for you. We have the DeFi expertise. Uh, we have all the security systems in place to not, you know, get exploited and lose your private key and lose your funds. Um, and we're, we're heavy DeFi users, so we can do it for you. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big uh, advocate of people learning how to do this themselves as well, but admittedly, I think UX and wallet, that kind of stuff is, it's, it's a real, um, uh, thing that we need to improve as an industry. Um, so with this, this first client that we ended up doing this for that person had a large amount of ETH and they were buying a home and wanted to borrow against their ETH rather than selling, um, they were getting ready to send a BlockFi. So we we talked them through, okay, BlockFi is gonna charge you more, the risks are worse um, in like, okay, you'll get liquidated at a higher ETH price, et cetera. So let's do it here. It was such an easy conversation. It was literally like a five minute call or less to get them on board because the the advantages are so stark. The amount of saved um, interest payments is, is pretty crazy. Um, so then we came in, uh, we, we minted some LUSD against their ETH, um, converted to USDC and shot that over to their, um, uh, to them. Uh, they converted, bought their home. And then what's interesting is the aftermath of that is a really good um, example of um, why this is so advantageous. That transaction happened before the 3AC meltdown. And, um, the three three AC meltdown happened, and um, ETH price, you know, nuked, and um, we were on the phone talking with that client about, okay, here's where your liquidation level is, et cetera, um, and uh, talking to them about how to risk manage. Like, okay, you know, if you want to get your liquidation price down, you know, send us some more um, assets over. At one point, they they sent some stable coins over, and we paid down the debt a little bit. And then at another point, sent some ETH over, and added to the collateral. And um, and and we looked at it. That that person um, would have lost their entire, basically their entire, almost their entire net worth, but all of their ETH if they had stayed in BlockFi, um, because. Uh, one, it takes a little bit longer on, on those centralized um, exchanges to get assets in the door. You send them ETH and then it has to, you know, uh, spend some time clearing their system and then they can you can add it to your collateral. So that's issue number one. But issue number two, the meltdown um, six months ago was so severe that um, they would have blown right through their liquidation price and, and lost everything on BlockFi. Well, um, there was a lot of um, uh, nervousness um, for the liquidity loan because it was like, how far is this going to drop? Like, I don't know, it, you know, the I have the numbers right off the top of my head because we we're like talking about it as it's happening. But when ETH just insta dipped down to below 900, their liquidation price was was well below that. But it just kind of felt like this free fall. How far will it go? Um, but they avoided liquidation 
And so the, the delta here for that particular client is, okay, we saved them um, six figures of interest payments a year plus their entire ETH stack. Um, because like I said, they would have been liquidated on BlockFi. Um, so that's like a good example of just how attractive it can be. Um, so exact same assets, exact same borrow, et cetera, you're going to be liquidated a lot faster in some of these other places because their loan value is so much less attractive. So um, I think uh, you asked a, a series of questions and I probably answered less than half of them. Remind me what else you wanted me to touch on. No, I think you will cover that um, uh, very well. So, um, and one additional question would be uh, from the customer's perspective, what are their questions, you know, if you kind of suggest liquidity, um, what, what is kind of their biggest concern or, or question for you? Um, there's there's always questions about um, the risks of the platform. So clients are, are aware that some that some DeFi platforms have been exploited, et cetera. So, okay, what is the, what are the risks look like? You know, have they been audited? What, you know, like give, give us a sense of the risk um, of the platform. How long has it been around, et cetera? So that's question number one. Um, and uh, um, question number two is, you know, obviously what are the parameters? How much am I gonna pay, et cetera? You know, are there any hidden like lurking, um, you know, things there? Um, hidden costs, et cetera. And then, and then the last question is, um, you know, is it big enough to facilitate me? Right. So, you know, if, if, if I have a client that wants to borrow $5 million against $10 million of ETH, just as an example, there may be a high quality alternative that just, um, that just won't, uh, be able to facilitate that because they don't have enough liquidity on curve and things like that. Um, so, uh, so that's a third um, third question. And then some of the questions also get into the comparison. So like if you're to compare liquidity to the alternatives, and I think there's a lot of high quality alternatives here. So, you know, in, in that very first client call we had, I walked them through several alternatives. Like, okay, here's what Aave would look like and the advantages of Aave. Um, okay, it's a variable interest rate that can change based on supply and demand. So you can't guarantee um, that you're, you know, that it's going to stay this low, but it's low. Okay. Um, that's great. Um, you can pull out at any time, et cetera. Okay. Here's what liquidity looks like, you know, for a longer term loan, that's even more attractive, um, uh, cost wise. And, and, um, and then, you know, here's what the allowed loan to value is, et cetera. And then like we looked at Alchemix. Okay. With Alchemix, uh, you don't have liquidation risk. The most you can borrow is a 50% loan to value. So if a person's trying to borrow 60, then they can't. Um, but if it's below 50, great. And then your risk profile is pretty different there. It's, you know, it's, it's um, uh, collateral lockup, um, you know, duration risk where, okay, if, you know, if the self-repaying loans repay very slowly, are you okay with that opportunity cost? And, and then also do, are there vaults open? You know, sometimes, sometimes they can't facilitate you. So, um, uh, so liquidity is is best in class in a few of the in a few of those regards. Um, obviously, high quality audits. It's been around for a while without an exploit. So check check, and then it's it's immutable and and that's a big check. You know, I like I said, I had a I, I referenced this earlier, but I had a call yesterday um, with a. Um, they're, they're a crypto native treasury um, looking to to get some stablecoin management. And they were asking us about our due diligence and they're like, and their thing was like, well, hey, if you do diligence this um, project and then they change the code, they, you know, they, they push some change to their um, code tomorrow, then your due diligence is, in, is maybe invalid or whatever. And, and my res response was that like, yeah, the immutability is a superpower, right? And we, we play in places that aren't immutable as well, but that like really reduces the risk in a lot of ways um, where, you know, you, you look at the history of exploits and the audits and the mechanisms and you, if all of those risks are like rip, look really solid, you can also be sure that it's not going to change. So um, those are a lot of the things that will, um, that clients are interested to know about and then we'll talk them through. Um, some clients are more, um, 
uh, you know, want more in depth than others. You know, some there's there's a high degree of trust we have with our with our clients, and um, and so like one of the clients that we did this for, that we basically pulled them out of BlockFi. They already had a BlockFi loan, and we basically pulled them into a liquidity loan. It was like it was like a less than a five minute conversation where it was like, um, here's the costs on BlockFi. Here's the costs here or in a few of these places, you know, and, and for you, we think liquidity looks really attractive. Um, here's a, a high level summary of their mechanisms and why we think that it's, it's like a, a really like resilient protocol done, you know? So, um, and honestly, those conversations have been so, so easy. Like I've, I haven't had pushback hardly anywhere. And then and that those conversations were easy before a lot of the centralized um, crypto entities started melting down. And since they have, I think people are much more um, on board with the uh, holy crap. Maybe I don't want my money on this platform that that will lock my assets. And so it's it's become even easier. And mm -hmm. so then it's just about okay, within DeFi, how are you vetting these? And I think in in several of the regards, um, liquidity is best in class, like immutability especially. Um, and then in, in um, you know, efficiency and, and things. And then and in some regards, like say MakerDAO is best in class. Like if, if someone was needing to do something crazy and borrow a hundred million dollars, okay, you're going to have to go to MakerDAO probably or Aave for that. Sure. And you, you know, that reminds me um, of a story you also told about a, a customer. Maybe it was the one that you just had the five minute pitch. But, but which I thought is interesting. I never thought it did way that in that way, because you said there was a customer and I think the only question he had is kind of, how is it possible that I pay only a 0 0.5 one off fee? <laughs> so maybe you can tell something on that and, and how you, you answered that question. Uh, yeah, good question. And that, that is something that, I, that I'll hear from some people is it sounds too good to be true. Um, I especially hear it from crypto skeptics of like, mm -hmm. um, especially if you if you talk about both at the same time like hey you can earn high uh, high yields on stables and you can borrow stables at zero they're like how is there a, a delta there like that mm -hmm. sounds like um something weird um so um the, the way we've spoken about that is like okay if you de if you deploy an immutable um system so you have no dev time ever again you know the liquidity team is not it has no ongoing costs um with liquidity because you know, you're not making upgrades to the software and you're super, super efficient with your mechanisms. It allows you to drive the cost to near zero. And liquidity is an interesting example of that. Like, OK, um, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but roughly 30 million dollars of, of uh, revenues it's generated I'm, it, it is what I'm remembering um, since its inception with no ongoing costs and 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 really um, uh, efficient mechanisms, it can be really profitable. Um, and, um, and, and the fact that the cost of maintenance and, and, and those things is, is zero means that you don't really need to generate hardly any revenue for the platform to stay, to stay solvent and to, to make sense for those who built and deployed it, et cetera. Um, so, so it's really that immutability and the efficiency that we tend to talk about there. Um, you know, if, 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 if you build a system that requires thousands of devs with constant upkeep, you're going to have to pay for those devs, right? And if you have, a, have to have a whole risk management team because you're um, doing things more dynamically with asset collateral types, et cetera, you're going to have to pay for those. So if you can get rid of all of those because you're immutable, you're taking just ETH collateral, et cetera, um, that's, that's the way that we, we talk about that piece. Um, uh, and... I think people can understand that pretty quickly. Yeah, I find it just so interesting, you know, kind of that people kind of the the, the question that they need to answer to trust the system was more kind of how, how is it possible that they 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 don't have interest, you know? So I, I find that interesting. And yeah, I mean, also for the for the listeners, I mean, how does it work? I mean, Liquidity has been working the protocol on its own more than one and a half year uh, autonomously. And in this time, issued the four billion in loans and managed on its own. Uh, yeah, and us actually watching from the sidelines. So I think just that, that you get a dimension or an idea how um, how that works. 
just a, a last quick question on, on that use case. How do you think uh, things will change now with the raising interest rates, especially in, in, in the US? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, so there's there's a number of dimensions to that. So um, borrowing against your assets um, on a place like liquidity becomes even more attractive, right? The delta um, is, is really high. So for someone who has collateral um, borrowing here versus getting a traditional mortgage to buy a home, for example, um, is, is um, extra attractive. So from that angle, I think it becomes more compelling than ever. Um, there is another angle that's interesting, though, where um, we are, like I said, we're managing stablecoin um, for yield um, for a, a number of clients. And um, that uh, angle is is the reverse to some extent, where, you know, if you are saying, hey, I can earn 5%, um, you know, a year ago, that was like, well, 5%, I can't, I can't get much, I can't get hardly anything in traditional markets. Okay. Um, but now um, a, uh, someone who's uh, working with us says, well, you know, you need to justify why I'm not just sitting in treasury bonds. Um, and um, that's been an interesting thing because during the, the height of the bull market, yields were really high and TradFi yields were nothing. And now yields are harder to find than they were back then, and TradFi yields are coming up. And so it's becoming um, less of a slam dunk in some cases. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're still earning better yield than you can get in TradFi given similar risks. Um, but uh, the bigger the delta, the easier the conversation, right? So, so in, in that regard, I think. Um, at a high level, you know, maybe um, flows into crypto, institutional flows into crypto uh, slow down for some period of time because there's there's um, finally some um, better options uh, in just buying bonds or whatever. So, um, uh, you know, we haven't had clients uh, turn away from us, um, uh, but we have had clients who said, hey, uh, you know, we have a target range of yields. And before they were like, we're super comfortable with you being at the low end of the range. And Often we were above the range, honestly, but like, you know, it's like, hey, do the safest of the safest. We don't care if you're at the low end of the range. And then um, the conversation has shifted where they're like, well, we really need you to be at the higher end of the range to justify the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, that that whole piece is, has inverted. And um, I think we'll probably see that cycle back and forth um, for a long period of time and as DeFi matures. Eventually, I think that they need to come in parity relative to their risks. And as DeFi protocols prove just how robust and resilient and low risk they are as far as counterparty risk, et cetera, the natural state of things in a decade, two decades is probably that DeFi yields are lower than TradFi yields because they're lower risk. And then that would be like, that would be like, uh, a natural thing, but it it'll be the reverse for you know as the industry um, matures. Okay, cool, great. So actually, I wanted to go to the next use case, but I see there was a question from the audience: What's a risk or kind of uh, of of liquidity or or a downside or what what you need to be aware if if you borrow with liquidity? I think we have seen a lot of great things and kind of to be transparent and fair, everything has pros and cons. Yeah. Maybe you can say something on that. Yeah, good, good question. So um, a, a few of the risks that I think um, are important to be aware of is, is one, you, you can get liquidated and liquidations are, are um, complete. You lose all of your collateral. Um, so that's, you know, if you're borrowing a lot against your ETH and then we're living in volatile um, conditions like this, um, that can be really scary. So, and, and actually this is a, a conversation we've had with some clients is, Hey, probably a good idea to pay loans down, you know, like, uh, volatile crypto assets are probably not things that you want to be borrowing high amounts of money at, uh, uh, against, you know, um, generally speaking. Um, so that's, that's, uh, piece number one is just, should you be borrowing against this asset in the first place? And, um, there's some risks there. 
And if you are going to do it, um, my suggestion is do it at an incredibly safe loan to value, um, very low loan to value, um, uh, be massively over collateralized. So that's, that, that's a suggestion I would have, like, you know, and we've seen this where people borrowed at what felt very safe and wasn't, you know, at the height of the bull market, if you borrowed 50% loan to value, that feels like, man, I have a giant buffer. And then you would have been blown up. Right. Um, if you just held the position because ETH was it's down way more than half what it what it was at the peak, right? So that's that's piece number one. It's just should you be borrowing against this asset in general? That's not liquidity specific though. Um, and then the two others that I would that I kind of would touch on are three, I guess. Um, if you are at the kind of front of the queue, you have this risk of getting redeemed against, um, which is uh, that's that's painful. It reduces your ETH exposure. And the whole reason you borrowed in the first place probably was to get some money without reducing your ETH exposure. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have just sold ETH to buy the house. Um, that's another reason to not be super risky with your your loan. You want to reduce the risk that you're um, the person to get redeemed against. Um, so that's number two. And then two others. Um, if you um, are a person who may enter the loan and then exit it pretty quickly, it's not quite as attractive. You do this upfront mint fee of a half a percent. Well, that's pretty attractive um, uh, uh, borrow cost. If you're sitting on a loan for a year, two years, three years, the longer, the better, because you're ongoing interest rate zero. But if you enter the position and then you change your mind and you want to pull out of it in a week, annualized, that's a pretty painful borrow cost. Um, so that's, that's a, that's another risk here is, is, um, uh, you know, how long are you, do you expect to be in this position? And then the last one is, um, you know, uh, LUSD does a really good job of holding its, um, keeping from depegging to the downside. Uh, but it often goes over peg and, um, that feels nice when you're minting. Um, uh, hey, I, I, I minted, it's, it's five cents over peg. I swapped to USDC, I got 5%, um, uh, you know, positive slippage, great. It's, it can be painful if you're needing to repay. And um, that, that is one thing that, you know, the UC can be kind of nice about systems that sometimes will depeg is it is free debt forgiveness. And, and, and we saw that uh, this week in Abracadabra, um, MIM started to depeg. It dropped maybe to, I think it was like 96-ish cents. And if you were in their Discord, a bunch of people were like, oh, great, I'm going to go repay my loans and get free free get free debt forgiveness. Um, LUSD basically never depegs to the downside, so you don't get to repay your loans at a discount. You don't get that nice benefit. Uh, and sometimes it depegs to the upside. And so... Um, so yeah, if, if it's really, you know, volatile conditions and, and you're like, shoot, I need to repay this loan and I don't want to get liquidated. And LUSD went from a dollar two to a dollar five. Um, that's, that's like an implicit borrow cost that you're bearing essentially. Um, and that's um, something to factor into the equation. You say, okay, I'm going to pay 0% on going forever, but I could pay 3% because I have to um, buy LUSD at a premium. Yep. I mean, fair point. So for users um, that are not aware, LUSD has pretty good and hard pegs uh, to the downside at one and at 110 uh, on the higher level. And usually, as uh, Red said, it, it can de peg upwards. We've seen it 103, 104, 05 at this range. And then there are soft forces pushing it down again. Um, yeah. I think that's definitely something to be aware, be aware of. Right now, it's around 104, which is on the higher side. As you said, if you open now a loan, you get kind of free debt. Um, but of course, if you need to repay something to factor in. And, and I think um, it's also because the system is immutable and running on its own. So it's not that the liquidity team could do something or now steer something. So it's also sometimes you call it a premium of resilience. Um, and, and why is the pr price so high? Because LUSD is in demand. People want to have it, but um, we, the system can't just mint LUSD. It needs to be backed. And in the beer market, uh, there is not so much borrow demand. So it's 
it's not nice, but it's it's an, something inherent in the system and somewhat that values the immutability and decentralization that's right now with the, today's um, uh, system designs, a bit the downside, which you need to be aware of. There are other systems which hold the pack much more in a better way, but where kind of you have other risks because it's not immutable, with the, because the collateral is lent out to a centralized player, all these kind of things. That resiliency premium is a really good way to put that. I, I really like that. And yeah, it's it's a downside, but um, for a lot of people, something that you're uh, that you may be willing to bear. And it's it, yeah, it's interesting. Normally, you, an overpeg is an implicit um, uh, incentive to borrow, and underpeg is an implicit incentive to repay. Um, but you you don't have the um, the underpeg as much. Um, and then there are things like like Abracadabra when they were depegging to the downside, they just came in and said, "Hey, we're increasing our interest on these different um, collateral types to encourage you to repay." And then you can do the opposite. If they were going over peg, they could come and say, "We're reducing interest on all of these to uh, incentivize people to borrow." Uh, you can't do that, but that's um, but you get these other really powerful benefits of being immutable. Um, that tendency to go over peg can be an attractive thing to someone on the other side of the aisle, uh, someone who's not wanting to borrow against their LUSD, but just wanting to earn yield on it, right? So if you're if if if, if you're a borrower on a platform like Liquidity, you don't really care that much about a DPEG. It's free debt forgiveness. Like um, you you can, you know, if, if Liquidity DPEGed to 50 cents and I had an open loan, wow, that's incredible debt forgiveness for me. I can just go and repay and great. Uh, you care about DPEGs a lot if you're a person who's holding that stable coin and earning yield on it. That's the person who really benefits from the fact that it it never DPEGs and or it it you know it doesn't tend to DPEG to the downside and can uh, accrue a premium. So if you bought LUSD at a dollar and you're earning yield on it, and then it pumps to a dollar five your true yield was higher than the yield you were earning. Um, you know, say, okay, you threw it in B protocol and you're getting X percent. Um, but then the price of our USD pumped to a dollar five. Um, you know, you can realize that gain by selling out of the position or, you know, it's just kind of baked in there. So, so the D peg up, upwards is, um, it's implicit borrow cost to someone who's trying to repay a loan, but it's also like implicit yield to someone who's holding that asset and, and, um, and, you know, trying to generate stable coin yield on it. Sure. Cool. So let's also touch on, at least on the second use case. But I think, um, so you mentioned the dollar cost averaging, you know, into ETH, which I think is a really interesting use case. Not a lot of people are aware of in liquidity because liquidity, usually people go to liquidity to borrow. As you said, you they give, him, they give their ETH as a collateral, take out this margin loan in LUSD. So that's, one use case, um, the borrowing use case, out of that, uh, people put LUSD, the stable coin, into circulation. And now th there is another part in the system called the stability pool, and it's part of the liquidation of these margins loan, margin loans, and that's part of the efficiency you mentioned. Liquidity has this instant liquidation that allows the protocol to have this high loan-to-value ratio. So there, there is um, capital in the protocol, if uh, there is a margin call, is instantly liquidated. But people have to provide uh, this li liquidity, and that's what we call the stability pool. Um, people put it the LUSD into this stability pool, and they earn some yield on it. One, the protocol is incentivizing it with its own token, um, and with the token, the, the depositors get access to the protocol revenue, which the protocol manages uh, on its own. And the other thing, because the debt is repaid with the LUSD, they get um, ETH in, in exchange for their LUSD. And because it's liquidated usually at a, at a discount of up to 10%, more or less. So that's just the mechanism to so for our users to understand that. And now, um, can you put that into perspective how this becomes a dollar cost averaging strategy to get into EVE? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, so we've, you know, during the market meltdowns, uh, the 3AC meltdown especially, um, but we're, you know, it's, it's happening kind of again right now. Um, 
a common question we get from some of our um, wealth clients is, you know, that are sitting on stable coins is like, hey, I would love to uh, start buying this dip. But um, there's always uncertainty, like, is are we near the bottom, et cetera. And so, um, so many of them, rather than just coming in and market buying ETH, will, will want to kind of you know, edge into it um, over the next few months. And uh, so a lot of those conversations came up, um, like I said, during the 3AC meltdown. You know, the the dumb way to do this, uh, you know, not dumb, but like, you know, the, the way a person might think to do this is like, okay, I have $100,000 of stable coins. I'll just buy 10K on Uniswap of ETH today. And then I'll come back in a week and do the same and so on uh and then you can make it you know slightly more attractive if you do um other kind of enhancements but it's like okay if i'm just gonna sit on usdc and then buy 10k a week um if instead i throw that entire amount into the liquidity stability pool okay number one i'm earning yield while i'm sitting on it um, and, um, and it doesn't require any active management. It's, it's a very simple deposit and kind of forget about it essentially. Um, so I'm earning yield while I'm sitting on it. And then, you know, when someone's liquidated, not only are you, people are liquidated when ETH price dumps. So not only are you buying the dip, but you're buying the dip at a 10% discount to the dip. Right. And so, you know, ETH dumps to a thousand um, and you, and you're a person who's like, whoa, you've dumped to a thousand. I want to buy some. Well, if someone got liquidated at that point, um, then it's like you actually bought it at 900, right. Um, which is, which is, uh, really nice. So it's like this, it's, it's like a, uh, a triple benefit. Now, like I said, the downside to it, and not, I wouldn't even call it a downside, but the only level of active management is say I had a hundred thousand, uh, USDC and I wanted to. And I wanted to um, buy 10K uh, worth of ETH a week uh, until I'm out. You can't guarantee that you'll be buying the full 10K a week. Um, if no liquidations happen, you bought nothing. And then if a massive liquidation happens, something insane, then maybe you bought more than that. Um, I think most people don't care as much like, okay, I DCA in a little bit faster, but I did it at a discount and I got paid out QTY, great. Um, uh, but you know, if, if you want to guarantee you're getting some ETH exposure and not just sitting in a pool and you don't end up DCAing. So in a worst case scenario, if you threw into uh, the stability pool and forgot about it um, and then no one got liquidated and a year later, you didn't have any of that ETH you were trying to DCA into. So that's the only level of, of management here where a, a pretty obvious enhancement to the just buying 10K a week is throw all of it in the stability pool and then pull 10K a week out to buy ETH uh, until you're fully deployed um, if you're looking to DCA. Cool. Yeah, th that's an interesting one with kind of, yeah, pulling it out. I think that's a nice addition to the ju just uh, letting it sit there. Um, cool. So all, we are almost up. Um, just looking if there are other questions, um, but is there anything kind of we didn't touch on you want to touch on? Um, I mean, we didn't look into the other in the yield cases, but or is there another aspect you want to highlight or talk about? Um, yeah, good question. I, I, I touched on most of the ways that we're, we're currently using the system. Um, and um, I, I personally think there are a number of really high quality DeFi protocols if you want to be a borrower um, or um, generate yield, et cetera. But liquidity is is a very attractive option for many people. Like the risk, the risk profile for many users is um, a, about as good as it gets. And um, and so um, it's been a common place for us to play. So really like a lot of congratulations to the liquidity team for building something that's so high quality and is meeting certain risk criteria in a way that nobody else is you know if you say hey what's a what's a protocol that doesn't have like really any censorship risk um because it doesn't have say usdc collateral under the hood um you're getting thin if you if you just have that one kind of parameter you're getting thin really quickly and then okay 
that also holds peg really well, that also has a reasonable amount of liquidity, that's also, you know, immutable, can't add collateral types. It's really the only one. So there's there's a lot of really uh, great things about liquidity that it's really the only one um, doing some of those things in, in a way that's um, uh, scaled up enough for um, people to, to be able to use it. In fact, some of those things, it's the only one I'm aware of that it's doing that. So anything else that exists is is small enough. I haven't heard of them yet, and and I um, I spend all day every day in DeFi. So there's you know nothing of reasonable size I'm I'm I haven't heard of really. Um, so so that's um, those are all um, uh, really great things. And I think there's this there's this thing I'm trying to educate people on, and there's which is just that. In, in many ways, DeFi is already far superior to CeFi. So if you're wanting to do things through central, like with crypto assets, through centralized um, entities, uh, you should ask yourself, why am I doing it there rather than on a, in, a, in a place like Liquidity? And, you know, for, for future builders, I, I also think that, you know, the BlockFi killer um, is going to be something that just plugs into a system like Liquidity or DeFi in the back end, and then it's just oh, okay. You're just a user friendly UI, and you do some marketing, and you know you custody assets effectively. You have you know a good solution there, and then you're just plugging into these things and passing through all of those um, you know uh, efficiencies to the user. Um, I think uh, you know that's that's kind of the BlockFi uh, killer of the future. I feel like. Um, just to, you know, not just block. See, C- C- in the front end and DeFi yeah. as, as a new backend, you know, as if as, what it is, it's a new financial backend. And, yeah. and it's nice that, that you're looking a bit in the future at the end and we are almost at the end with time. So my, my last question is also a bit an outlook. Where do you think kind of will we be with DeFi in 2023, you know, the end? What, what's the big thing you think will, will happen, will evolve next year? Oh man, within the next year. Um, good question. I think um, we're going to have, yeah, I mean, this is actually on a completely different different topic, but I think as, as L2s are maturing, um, for example, uh, and, and other scaling things are improving, I personally think that it unlocks a lot of DeFi things that were harder to do before, and we're already starting to see some of that. So I think we start seeing a lot more maturing of like derivatives exchanges. That's that's a completely different topic than this, but a lot of those things were really infeasible at layer one, and you're seeing derivatives ex- exchanges getting a lot of usage at layer two, um, and and in some of the more scalable blockchains. So that's that's a, a segment of DeFi I see maturing a lot over the next year. Um, over the next five or 10, I see a lot of like maturing, um, risk, like for the, for the big blue chip, like, uh, perceived risk, um, coming down because there's already lower risk for a lot of these. And then also true risk coming down. And so then I see, I see like more inflows and more kind of DeFi mullets, like, you know, centralized front end DeFi on the back end. I see that becoming much more of a thing. Um, uh, but that'll take probably more than a, a, a year. Like, I think that's something that you see over time where this becomes the infrastructure for all the major traditional financial institutions. Cool. That, like a decade long thing. Yeah. Hey, th- that was amazing. Um, I'm so thankful you, you came up um, and did this session with us to hear the, the client stories, uh, especially, and how you use it at Wave Financials. Um, where can users, listeners find you or also wife financially if they want to learn more? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I'm on Twitter, uh, and my handle is, is, is my name, Rhett Ship, R-H-E-T-T-S-H-I-P-P. Uh, Wave, um, also has, uh, Twitter, Wave underscore financial. Um, and, uh, on, on the Twitter, you can find the, the website, et cetera. Um, Cool. And uh, I'm really glad to be a big fan of, of Liquidity and, and uh, we've loved using your platform. Thanks. And we loved using, uh, hearing your feedback. And we'll uh, link all the, the details in, in, in the YouTube. So there will be a recording. So you'll find also all the links there. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was amazing talking to you. Yeah, same, same. We'd love to talk again. Um, thanks. Thanks so much.
Bye, Red. Bye.